Hey, and welcome to Journey Church Eva. Our mission here at Journey is to help you discover your real life purpose in Christ so you can make a difference in your world. We would love to hear from you. Check out the show notes for a link to send us an email and a link if you want to give. There's also a link for prayer requests. We have a prayer team that will touch God on your behalf. So send us those prayer requests and let's all watch God move in your life together. You will also find the like, comment, and the subscribe buttons below. Go ahead, hit all three of them. But most importantly, we want you to hit the share button and let's send this message to those of your friends and family that may need some encouragement today. Now, here's today's message. We hope it blesses you, challenges you, and helps you grow stronger in your walk with Jesus. Father, we thank you for what you've done, what you are presently, continually now doing, and what you're fixing to do in these next moments with your word. And Father, we need a stirring, we need an awakening, not a wokeness, but we need awakening in this church and the body of Christ. In Jesus' name, be with this word. Amen. Amen. All right, starting a brand new message series today called, everybody say, freedom. 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 Come on, take you a lap. That's fine. Take you a lap. See, that's freedom. Freedom comes in all different shapes and sizes. It does. Now, some of you may say, why is he in this black robe today? Well, because I like it, number one. And I've never done this before. And, uh, but this is what actually was worn without this, of course. I don't think they had these. But this is what actually was worn when our nation was founded by the pastors in the colonies. Amen. When they began to set up the colonies and, and begin to build churches and schools and universities and businesses and things like that, this was the appropriate attire for pastors back in those days. And it didn't matter what denomination it was, you, they wore a black robe. We're going to talk about that here. We're going to learn some more about this over the course of the next few weeks. Now, America was comprised of British colonies. Amen? So this, this did belong to Britain at one time, Great Britain, under King George III. Okay, that was who was the king of Britain at the time. And, and we came over here and founded and got colonized. And the Brits came in and said, okay, you need us. And they'd been through the, uh, one war already, the war uh, of, of the Indian War. And, and here, here they are now. They're, they're starting to thrive. And the king's putting taxes on them like crazy. Yeah. I mean, he's like, you know, you're going to pay us. All right? Well, they got a little fed up with the taxes. And when they sent letters to complain by the... Now, in, in each colony area, territory, there would be a governor that was 100% loyal to King George. Amen. And they had, they had a handful of troops here and there to kind of keep order and maintain order. Although there was not that much law breaking. Because these people had morals. These people were thankful for the land God had blessed them with, so they didn't bother trying to steal their neighbor's food or their neighbor's wife or murder this person. So there was very little time. They were there to enforce taxes on the people and the will of the king on people in case they didn't want to. Okay? Are y'all getting this? How many had history in high school or school? Now, it got to the point where pastors began to preach on freedom and liberty from the pulpit. And it began to stir up some things in the, in the, in the colonists there. And King George got to the point when word was getting back to him on what they were preaching because in this new colony, colonization we have called America at this time, there was no state religion. That's one of the reasons they came here, to get away from a one, one religion government. And so during this time, they began to preach from the Word of God about freedom and truth and how every man is free in Christ. Whom the Son sets free is what? Free, free indeed. Amen. And so as they begin to preach this, King George didn't like it because they don't want citizens, they want subjects. And so as the preachers begin to do this, King George sent out a decree and said, I want all the pastors to pre-write their sermons, send them to the governor, and they have to be pre-approved before they can preach them. That began to happen. Now we say, oh my gosh, what a, what a, what a terrible, everybody said terrible government. It's terrible. That had never happened here. Let me read you an article. Yes, let me read you an article out of Houston, Texas. And this happened in October 2014. 
And it reads as follows. Houston's first openly lesbian mayor, Annanise Parker, has just issued subpoenas to over 400 pastors requiring them to turn in all sermons and or internal communications that might relate to homosexuality, gender identity, or Ananisa Parker herself. And any pastor who fails to submit their sermons could face hefty fines and or jail time. 2014, United States of America, Houston, Texas. And thank God, now what's sad is, right out of the gate, a few of those pastors begin to quake in their boots and send it in. But there was a handful of them that said, no, this goes against our rights. We're not doing this. You're not our Lord. You're not our dictator. You will not tell us what to preach. And immediately they launched a lawsuit, and of course they won. Thank God they won. A lot of us, was, I was watching this very closely going, oh, this could be the time. Here we go, folks. Now, but King George was so upset because one of the things that the preachers, the pastors, was preaching is that Jesus is king of all kings. Now, if you're a king, you kind of think that might be a dig if you don't like Jesus. I'm a king, but now they're telling over here in these little peasant colonies, these subjects are telling people that there's a king greater than George III? He didn't set too well with that. Come on. As a matter of fact, King George put out a hit list. And there were seven names on the first hit list. Everybody say seven. Now, the reason he put the the hit list out was he told the governors and he started sending in a few more troops because he's seen where things were going. He started sending in a few more redcoats and told these governors, find these seven men because they are instigating something that we must suppress. They're instigators. Today, they would be known as domestic terrorists. Of which I am in the classification of. A domestic terrorist, according to the standards right now. And I'll be going over those with you to prove it here in a little while. Not today, but next coming weeks. Now, they all are to be gathered up and either... Put them, on, put them out publicly and hang them there or ship them back to Great Britain and they will hang them publicly there with no trial and no due process. In other words, their, any rights they did have, what little bit they did have is suspended because the king said so. Because they're domestic terrorists talking about freedom and talking against what Britain's doing to them in the Tea Party and y'all know how that is. And They tax their tea, dear God. That can't be the Lord right there. Now, there were seven of them And I want to talk about the two first, then the other five. You may recognize a couple of them. The first two they were after, not necessarily any order, but one of them's name was John Adams. The other's name was John Hancock. John Adams actually studied at Harvard to become a pastor. But in the middle of it, he realized that what his actual gifting and calling, he thought he'd be more appropriated as a lawyer. So he went into law and began to be a Christian lawyer, if there is such a thing. There is such a thing. Okay. (laughs) I know it's rare. It's like seeing a unicorn, but they're out there, okay? And then John Hancock, as you know, he was a statesman, a professional man, and they were both integral in founding. They're known as one of part of our founding fathers. So you had John Adams, John Hancock, on this hand, and then the other five were pastors. The other five on the original seven hit list from King George was five pastors and two patriots. That ought to tell you something right there. Look at your neighbor and say, wow. See, they don't tell you everything. So my friends, I'm here to tell you today, it was the pastors that started this stuff. And it, they didn't start it outside their house or in a small group. They started it in the church where it should have been started, where they could preach with freedom and liberty. Can I have a better Amen. 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 Now, so this all comes to the head. Again, I've got to go fast because we're, we're going to crunch some stuff here. On April 18th, 1775, let me get my reading assistant with me. John Adams and John Hancock were at the home of the Reverend Jonas Clark. Now, not one of the Jonas brothers, young people. It wasn't a lineage there. His first name was Jonas. He were at the home of the Reverend Jonas Clark. So that shows you where they wanted to hang out. 
They hanging out with the pastor. He was a Lexington pastor and a militia leader. Talk about a terrorist. A pastor and a militia leader. Which goes to show you there were militia before the war broke out. Because they had the right to defend themselves. There was no formed army. Every little group had their own security. If something got out of hand, they went and handled it. As militia. Militia is not a bad word. It's a phenomenal freedom word. It's not a terrorist word. It's a freedom word. Now, so the Lexington pastor and militia leader, that same night on August 18th, 1775, Paul Revere come riding up and arrived at the pastor's house and told them of the approaching redcoats that were on their way into their, their colony. The next morning, British Major Picardon shouted out to an assembly of regiment Minutemen. Minutemen. And here's what the, the king's commander said. Disperse, ye villains! Lay down your arms in the name of George, the sovereign king of England. And immediately, Pastor Jonah stepped up and said, first note please, this is what the pastor jumped up and said, we serve no king but King Jesus. Yeah. Can I have a better amen? Yeah. And then he goes on to tell them this. Now leave that up there for a minute. They said, we're not going to recognize no sovereignty but of God, and we recognize no king but King Jesus. That was actually the first note. I might have left it out. But this one, just go ahead and leave it up because it's next. Okay? And that began it all. That's where it started, y'all. In the church, from the pulpit, with believers of Christ, saying, we're not going to bow down. We're not going to cower down. We're not going to bow down. We outnumbered, oh, yes. Are we out weaponized? Oh, heck yeah. But you got to remember, we got King Jesus. Yeah. Can I have a better amen? Now, the British blamed and named these pastors. And you're going to hear a lot about this over the next course of this series. This group of pastors, not just the five, there were others. They were known and they got their name from King George and the British authority. They began to call them the Black Robe Regiment. Anybody ever heard of that? Raise your hand if you've ever heard of the I don't expect any young people to raise their hand. They don't teach that to you. The Black Robe Regiment was responsible for America and the start of the Revolutionary War because it came out of the pulpits, freedom went into the people, and the people when they... Mm. Well, <laughs> y'all okay? It was quoted by the British government... That the Declaration of Independence was nothing more than the sermon notes from the Black Robe Regiment. That's what the our Constitution, our Declaration of Independence, our Bill of Rights came out of sermon notes from these men, from the Black Robe Regiment and the Christian lawyers and the patriots that teamed up and led a nation of its freedom. And here we sit today in more captivity than they were in back in the founding days. Do you understand something? They got ticked off because their taxes were too high. They got ticked off because they told them, give us your guns. Surrender your weapons. That was the two major things they got ticked off about and said, we're not putting up with high taxes and you're not getting our guns. We'll go to war. But yet we sit here today. A man can marry a man. A woman can marry a woman. You can marry a dog, an animal, an elephant. I don't care. You can kill a baby in a womb, you can kill a baby in nine months. They're passing laws where you can kill it outside the womb. The church is just sitting here. Make me feel good, pastor. Don't stir this up. Oh, I'm, I can't stay in this church because it's a political church. No, we are not political, we're biblical. Yeah. Marriage is between a man and a woman. Life begins at conception. And you ain't going to go. And we're taxed, and we're taxed, and we're taxed, and we're taxed. And if somebody dies, it's paid taxes all their life on that money, and you get it, you got to pay taxes on it again. Inheritance, death tax, tax on your property. 
Everybody says, well, I own my property. No, you don't. The government owns everything here. Try not paying your property taxes. See what happens. See how long you own your property. Do you think our forefathers would have put up with this junk? Here we sit. Well, I love y'all. <laughs> now, and I'm going to show you some of this next week or so. But the thing about the Black Robe Regiment, when the king would put out the news and they controlled the media, they controlled the narrative and say, you're going to start paying this and you're going to start doing this and we're, this is going to be the rule of law. The pastors would preach what was in the news. They would immediately address something. Right out of the gate. If it went against God's word, those pastors are saying up there, did y'all read the decree this week? But here's what thus saith the word of God. And we're not going to bow down because we serve no king but King Jesus. Amen. And so what these pastors and these men like John Adams and John Hancock began to do, they began to print some of their own stuff. And they hung posters with this right here all over their colonies. We serve no king but King Jesus. And then he said this. Now notice the writing here. Either capital God will be your capital king, meaning God the deity of God. And then they lowercased it and said, or your king, talking about King George, will be your small case God. Y'all remember what I prophesied here probably 10, 15 years ago? There will come a day when this church will have to choose if we live long enough. We will either have to serve God or we will have to serve the government, but you will not be able to serve both. You'll trust in one or the other. You will put your trust in God or you'll put your trust in government. That was over 10 years ago when the Lord gave me that. It's still true today and we see it coming even more true in our time. And everybody says, well, Roe versus Wade did this. Yes, and I thank God for it. But it did leave it up to the states. And there will be states that will have late-term abortions and after-birth abortions. I can guarantee you that. They're passing. We're getting it right now. But there will be states, hopefully, like Alabama. It'll say, we're not having any abortions in our nation. And then we're not going to settle for anything less. We're not going to let them dangle a carrot and say, well, what about if it's just we stop it at nine months? No, we, every life is of God. Well, yeah. now today's just an introduction. I'm trying not to get too cranked up today because I've got to save some for the next couple of weeks. We're going to crank next couple of weeks, okay? Y'all okay? Yeah. Now, the first thing I want to tell you, it's the next note I think in the list, is here's what we've been suckered into believing as a nation. Go ahead and put up the next note. Go ahead and put up the next one. I've been told that church can't speak out against the government because we're 501c3 organizations. Isn't that what we've been taught? Yes, yes. It is exactly what we've been taught. Now, I'm going to go over 501c3 later on. 501c3 is a tax exemption for a church, but it's also a thing of the devil to say, you'll be tax exempted, but you can't preach politically. Now, it's been challenged a couple of times, and they don't want to take it to court because if it's a, if it's a just court, they'll lose every time to say, you can't, I don't care if you got 501c3, bo 5 r 9 I don't care what it is, you can't tell a man in America what he can and can't preach. But they're trying to, and a lot of them will cower down because the government will step in and say, oh, if you do this, we will take away your 5013C status. What does that mean for you? That means what you give here, you can't count off on your taxes. But I'm going to tell you this right here. If you give for a tax break, stop giving anyway, you coward. I give because the Bible tells me to give. I don't give to get a tax break. And if that's the only reason you give, you, you, your finances is cursed already. They didn't have 501c3 up until a few years ago. And the church did great. And it prospered. So, I can't speak out against the government. Christians, we shouldn't speak out against the government or the governing authorities. We shouldn't have a voice in politics because the Bible doesn't do that. Jesus wore the Pharisees out. Jesus wore the Sadducees out. He whipped them out of the house of God. Now, we know those, but I want to show you in the book of Luke. We're going to be in Luke for just a little bit here. The book of Luke, chapter 3, verse 15 through 20 says this. Go ahead and put the first scripture up. Everyone was expecting the Messiah to come soon. There was an expectation that Messiah is fixing to show up on the earth. 
And they were eager to know whether John, talking about John the Baptist, is the Messiah. Because here's this big woolly dude out in the middle of nowhere, man. He is a rebel, man. He is preaching like a madman. He's baptizing people. And they're like, man, he he's commands the audience when they come in. He, he's not shucking nobody. He's telling it like it is. He could be the Messiah. And they're wanting to know. And, and rightfully so. I would have too. In the next verse. And John answered their question by saying, I baptize you with water, but someone is coming soon who is greater than I am. So much greater that I'm not even worthy to be his slave and untie his sandals. I didn't worthy to do the straps of his sandals. <laughs> he, this one coming, the real Messiah, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Somebody say the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, see, we like our baptisms pretty. Just give me a little water, give me a little dunk, and let me be done. And that's what I told all three of these today. I don't want you going up there and getting wet. I don't want you going up there and just going through a pool. I want you to get everything God died for you to have. Because the Bible says the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives in us. And if Jesus, got, Jesus didn't do a single miracle in 30 years until he was baptized, and for three years it was signs, wonders, miracles, healings, deliverance, casting out demons, raising the dead. If he got that in baptism, the same person baptized them that baptized Jesus. And no, I was not there. All I had to do up there, I got the privilege of doing the mechanical part and wording it over them. But it was the Lord God Almighty that baptized these three people today. And I want to tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt, if the Bible's real, any part of it's real, then it's real, then you have the power, the same power Jesus Christ does. Now go out and start doing what he did. Can I have a better amen? amen. It's time for the church to be equipped and get off the bench and get in the game yes, on every level of our life. But anyway, lest I digress here. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. Now look at verse 17. He, Christ, is is ready to separate the chaff from the wheat with a winnowing fork. It's like a big pitchfork. And they would take the wheat and they would throw it in the air and the wind would blow away the chaff, which was no good, and let the seed and the berries fall to the ground. And then the chaff, if it got gathered, they would burn it up because it's worthless. Now look at this. He's coming to do the same thing. Are you with this? Jesus is coming into the earth to separate the wheat and the tares, the goat and the sheep, the real and the fake. The Christian is pressing in by the grace and the power of the Holy Ghost and those who are faking it to make it. Then he will clean up the threshing area where they thresh the wheat, gathering to the wheat into his barns, into his self, but burning up the chaff with never-ending fire. My friends, that's talking about hell. And if you've never heard hell in a sermon lately, let me tell you something. That's talking about hell. That's talking about if you are not of Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior, then you are going to burn forever, never ending fire in a pit of hell. That's Bible. Don't like it? Don't care. It's Bible. I didn't submit this message to anybody before I preached it. Verse 18. John used many such warnings as he announced the good news to the people. So in other words, John's preaching this fired up self. He's saying, listen, some of y'all going to hell coming down here listening to me. Yeah. If you ain't right with the Lord, you're going to hell. If you, if you obey in Caesar and all these, these demonic things to sacrifice to Moloch and Baal and all these false gods, y'all going to hell. Yeah. That's what he's telling them. He ain't, he, ain't, he ain't afraid. He ain't backing up. And, and the governmental officials would come and stand on the outside, and the, the Pharisees, the quote, religious people, would stand afar and listen to him and plot to take his life. Yeah. Now watch this. Look at this next verse. Let's read it together. One, two, three, read. John also publicly criticized Herod Antipas, a ruler of Galilee, for marrying Herodias, his brother's wife, and for many other wrong things he had done. Come on. Here's the man of God. Ain't afraid to criticize the covenant. Are you with me? And at that time, that's his pulpit. 
And the church is there. And he's saying, yeah, here's, here's Herod. He did this wrong. This ain't right. And we're going to stand on it. And the many other things that Herod was doing that was wrongful. Now watch this. Verse 20. So Herod put John in prison. Imagine that. But watch this. When he put John in prison, you know what it did to Herod? It added to the sins of his many other ones. It was a sin to put the man of God in prison for preaching the gospel. But you're being led to believe it's not going to be a sin when they begin arresting preachers. It, exactly. It happened just in Canada. When a pastor wouldn't shut his church down because the people wanted to meet and he flew back in. Now look here. He said he would surrender to them. He said, oh, you know, you ain't going to have no, I'm running. I ain't going nowhere. But he had come to America to meet with some American pastors. When he flew back into Canada, the SWAT team was there. They did this huge publicity takedown of him, put him down, handcuffed him. And, of course, he got out finally. But if you ask somebody on the street, oh, well, they arrested the pastor because it's the law. He should have been arrested. He was breaking the law. But when you tell people this and they don't know the truth, then they get behind that movement to say, yeah, these preachers need to be shut up. We need to shut these churches down. Now, as long as the church don't be filled with the Holy Spirit and do things biblically, well, we'll let them stand as long as they just be good little peasants. Be good little peasants. Go out there and meet, but don't come out of your church with anything. Don't have an opinion publicly. Don't put nothing on your social media. Don't say nothing in your workplace. Don't say nothing in the schoolhouse. Just you go along to get along and we'll leave you alone for a while. For a while. Well. So here we have this rebellious pastor. Who's, he don't care what the government says. Who's going to preach what he wants to preach. And he don't give a rip. What does Jesus have to say about John? What would Jesus think of someone like this? Well, let's go on down into Luke and find out what Jesus actually thought about John. Luke chapter 7, verse 28, the words of Jesus Christ written in red. For I say to you, among those born of women, there is none greater than the prophet than John the Baptist. John the Baptist was a prophet. He wasn't just a Baptist. <laughs> He's a prophet. Now, I got news for you, and I love my Baptist friends, but if they find this scripture out that he's a prophet, they'll throw him out. He got to go. We don't do that here. All my Baptist friends know I'm kidding. I love all of y'all. I really do. I do love my Baptist brothers. I prayed for one this morning. None greater. There's no greater prophet than John the Baptist. He's the forerunner of Messiah. He came to announce Messiah, and he did. And then look at the last part of this, though. Still Jesus speaking. But he who is the least in the kingdom of God is greater than he, talking about John the Baptist. Count me in the least of the kingdom. I want to be counted in the least of the kingdom because if I'm the least in the kingdom, I'm going to have a greater anointing and prophetic ministry than even John the Baptist had, baby. I'll take that all day long. Bring it on, Lord. The least of these. And one of my main messages to try to wake this church up and wake this generation up is if John the Baptist was the forerunner of Jesus Christ's first coming, it is you and I today that are the forerunners of his second coming. And we need to be as radical as John the Baptist. We don't need to be afraid of government. We don't need to be afraid of officials. We don't, matter of fact, they should fear us. And you know what happens when you start seeing persecution? It is because they do fear you. As long as you're not a threat to their way, then they'll leave you alone. But the moment you become a threat, they'll take you off. They'll cancel your subscription. They'll do this. They'll do that. And these are just the beginnings. In the next few weeks, <clears throat> I'm going to do a part of my message. It's in their words alone. And I will show you video footage of people talking about one world government coming, how they're setting it up, how they now have become gods themselves. And I'm going to show it to you now. I've been challenging Matt that we're probably going to have to find a new format to do our live service on because I'm probably fixing to get us kicked off. Just being real. And Matt can tell you, I come to him probably three or four or five months ago. I said, we need to start looking because I can see the writing on the wall. I'm shocked we're still on right now. 
<laughs> yeah. yeah. Especially after Father's Day when you're sitting up here with AR-15s and guns and giving them away and assault bats and assault hammers. and ass- y'all say, yeah, I did have that assault screwdriver. <laughs> now, we, 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 let me tell you something. We come close this week, very close. I forgot and left the assault hammer laying on my desk. And Mr. Ray walked in, and it, I, it, I thought it almost jumped up and nailed him. I, I forgot. I told Ray, I said, be careful! He said, what? I said, the assault hammer's out there, and I forgot to put it up. It might jump up and just nail you on its own. Because, you know, that's how they all work. It's never the heart of man that's evil. It's always the, the, the tool or the instrument that we've got to take away from you. So here we are. This generation literally could be the John the Baptist generation announcing the second coming of Christ. He's coming again. And he's not coming to die. He's not coming to be whipped. He's not coming to be crucified. He's coming as King of kings and Lord of lords. The Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. He's coming with fire in his eyes. He's coming with a scepter in his hand. And he's gathering up the wheat from the tare. He's gathering up the sheep from the goats. And he's calling us into his fold in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And all you got to do is accept him and his word, and you shall be saved. You shall be saved. This black robe regiment, there's a couple of, I got on the internet and studied them a little bit, there's a couple of organizations that's firing this thing back up. And I'm looking into them about becoming official with them, but I don't have to be official, I'm in it. I've been in it, didn't even know I was in it. I'm like, wow, I'm already there. Thank you, Lord. I want to close with this. Come on, Rodney. Still in the book of Luke, chapter 4, verse 16 through 21. Jesus Christ's ministry is flowing now. He goes into church, what he calls the temple or the synagogue. And I want to, oh, yeah, go ahead and put it up. So he, Jesus, came into Nazareth where he had been brought up Now read the next one, two, three, four, five words with me. And as his custom was. Stop right there. I've got to take a little sidetrack here. Because what's going on now, they want to make church irrelevant. And they've done a pretty good job at making church irrelevant in people's lives. And, and And I want to honor you today for being here on 4th of July. I give you a hand in the name of Jesus. You could be at the lake. And again, now listen, if you're out vacationing and you, man, you heard me, go, ah, man, go, go vacation. But there are some people that go, well, it's a holiday weekend. We just don't go to church. We're going to have a staycation. We're going to do this or that other. And there's people at the lake and they had it planned. And I'm glad they're at the lake this morning getting refreshed. I have no, because why? Because when they are here, they are faithful. But the point about church being irrelevant and, oh, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian and, oh, you don't have to do this. And, oh, you, no, you don't have to go to church to do anything. But if you're born again and you know God has birthed this church in the earth and church is not perfect, that's why you need to go because you're so perfect. <laughs> but this thing about church attendance is this or that or the other, look at those words. Jesus Christ himself came into Nazareth where he'd been brought up as was his custom. Which means this is was Jesus' lifestyle. When he went in anywhere, his custom, his lifestyle, his life was to be in the house of God. So don't you tell me church attendance ain't important. Don't you tell me that, that you don't need the church and the, and the church is out this, that, the other. Jesus went into imperfect churches everywhere he went. So if Jesus went to church, I'll see you next Sunday. Well, did Jesus? Yeah, he did right there, as his custom was. Now watch this. He went into the synagogue. He went into the church on the Sabbath day. And he stood up to read. And it was handed him the book of the prophet Isaiah, the next verse. They brought up the book of the prophet Isaiah here to the Lord Jesus Christ. And, he had, and, and when he had opened the book, he found the place. Now watch, watch this right here. Don't go yet. He found the place. They brought him the scrolls. He scrolled open. And he, was, he just didn't go like many of us do. And I've done it before too, so I'm not trying to bring no... Okay, Lord, give me a daily Bible read. Okay, right there. Bam. <laughs> Raise your hand if you've ever done that. Welcome to, the, welcome to Christianity 101. We've all probably done it, Lord. I, you know, I'm not in a really good rhythm of reading. Just, you know, hey, surprise me, Lord. And have me know sometimes he does. It's good. Okay. 
I'm not saying God can't move in it. I'm just saying don't, don't let that be your lifestyle of studying the Word. Okay? So Jesus opens the scrolls, but he just didn't go, okay, where, Lord, where do you want me to read? He was hunting something specific from the prophet Isaiah who had prophesied something. And that something that was prophesied had a timetable on it. All prophecies have a time stamp on them. Some of them we know when, some of them we don't, but, but God knows when. And so he found this one particular scripture. He goes, aha, there it is. Years and years and years before I ever arrived on earth, I had this prophet say this, and they wrote it down. The scribes wrote it down. And it's time. Yeah. It's time. He pulled that scroll open. He found that passage. Go ahead and put it up. And Jesus Christ began to read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Now watch this. He sent me to proclaim liberty. Freedom. Liberty to the captives. And to recover the sight of the blind. Physical, spiritually, mentally, emotionally. And to set at liberty, freedom. Those who are oppressed. Yeah. Yeah, we can give Jesus a hand clap for that. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. To set at liberty. To proclaim liberty. Now watch this. And I didn't catch this till last night. Proclaim liberty. Word's going to go out. Word's going to go out. going to proclaim liberty. But after I proclaim it, I'm going to come in. And I'm going to set it. You can proclaim liberty. But until you set it in place with authority and dominion and power, you're just talking about it. And I know a lot of good Christians right now, a lot of good so-called patriots. Boy, they talk a big game. But they ain't setting nothing into motion outside their mouth. Well... We went from having a good time to an old, not an amen and oh me. We need to continue to proclaim it, but we've got to get a vision, we've got to get a strategy, and we've got to start getting a plan to start setting it in place. And I've told you for the last several months, the Lord's been revealing to me that the government is all local. You affect national government by local government. So we need some of you men and women of God to rise up and get on the school board. You don't want wokeism and critical race theory preached in your church and, and homosexual junk talk to your kids. You get on the school board and you stop it from happening. Get into the city council. Get into the mayorships. Get into the government on a state level. If we don't, and then, we, then, we, then all we got to do is elect people who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, this is what you get. You can't expect people who are not godly to do God's work all the time. Now, God can still use them beyond themselves. But how much more would it be if we had a godly school board? And I'm not saying we don't. We live in a very blessed area. We still have some godly school board members. But don't think there's a plan to leave them in there. Because you can't afford the agenda if you have godly people in the way. Hey, I got I to keep pressing on. Rodney, your finger be cramped up back here. He said, I thought you were leaving. <laughs> he got that new shiny red keyboard. I'm going to let him play it a little longer. You know, it's red because of, of, of Jesus' blood and, 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 and Alabama. Crimson Tide, but anyway. <laughs> Can I just stop? I, I mean, we're really fixing to go, okay? For those of you that came for baptism today and visited, I'm not apologizing, but boy, did you pick a Sunday, okay? You're, you may not be used to this kind of church, all right? Uh, welcome anyway. Uh, uh, yeah, we, w we welcome you and we thank you here. We're not crazy. We are crazy for the Word of God in Jesus Christ. Love Him and love you. And, and... But here's the thing about it. Next verse says it all. Jesus says, I'm here to do all this and I'm going to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. I'm going to proclaim this is the year, the acceptable year of the Lord for the church to rise up and take back what's been stolen from it. Take back what the enemy has invaded and said it's their territory and they've made you a subject, not even a citizen. You are going to be subject. No, we're not. 
I'm not going to be subject. I'm subject unto one king, and his king is Jesus. And I'm going to proclaim the gospel, and I'm going to set the freedom, and I'm going to do everything within my power to make sure that we can live free by the word of God. I want to hand my kids and my grandkids something that not, they can grow up in and not be ashamed of themselves. Good catch. The last note I want to leave you with. I want you to take a picture of it or write it down. Go ahead and put the last note up. No, wait a minute. No, no go back. 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 Let me read the last verse. Go ahead and put that last verse back up. <laughs> I forgot. To proclaim himself a year. Now go ahead. Verse 20. Then when he done that, he, watch this. He closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. Everybody's eyes was looking at him because of what he had just read. Everybody in the church was looking. And then the last verse. <laughs> and then Jesus began to say to them, Today, this very scripture that I just read has been fulfilled in your ears. In other words, the time is here. He is here. He is still here in you and me. The time is now again. The time never went away. But somewhere we went to sleep. And we got lazy and we got lax because we enjoy our freedoms and we don't understand the price that was paid. And now here we are. We're fixing to look at it, having to contend for our very freedoms that we feel that we once had. But we'll have them again. Either here or in glory. Totally free. So now put up that last note. Thank you. A silent sideline Christian is nothing more than a defeated compromised Christian. When you can't pray at work, somebody says, you can't pray at work. You can't stop me. I can't pray at the schools. You can't stop me. Now, I've not made a spectacle when I've done these things. But every school I've ever walked into and walked down the hallway, my hands have been out and I've prayed over those lockers. I've prayed over those classrooms. And yes, I was praying in the Holy Ghost. I was praying in a, an unknown tongue. Not to show out, not to draw attention. But to say, I'm going to pray for these kids. Why? Because God would pray for them. I've never not been able to pray anywhere I've went. Now, they've told me, oh, we don't do this here. Oh, well, I'm sorry you don't, but I do. <laughs> now, I'm, again, I'm not doing it out of, out of blatant rebellion, but I'm doing it out of obedience to God. And I don't make a spectacle of it, and I've never gotten thrown out yet. <laughs> yet? I, I can see it coming one day. But here's the thing, you know, you know what happened when I told him, I said, I'm sorry, I'm going to do it. And I'm not doing it out of disrespect, I'm doing it out of respect to my God. Every one of them backed up and said, okay. They've never been challenged with truth. And I did it with love, not anger. I did it with respect to them. Because the Bible tells me to respect those people. And I will respect them up to the point when they try to override what my respect for God is. And then I'm going to go with God. Now, when you don't know your rights, your rights can easily be taken from you. When you don't know you've got a right, and the government says, sit down and shut up, and you go, well, that must be right. Oh, no, now's the time to get up and speak up. Because that's the thing they fear the most is unity in the church. Now, I'm, I'm going to try to quit on this one. I can unify ball teams. I can unify black, white, red, green, purple people. Yeah. But let me tell you something. The hardest thing in the world to unify in America is the church. Yeah. It's hard to get them to stand together. So hard. But if we ever do, this stuff will be a piece of cake. God will be completely back control of our land again. Instead of where it's at today, because we've sat around and let it happen on our watch. Well, this black robe regiment member right here of the kingdom of God is going to keep preaching the way I keep preaching. Amen. And I don't care if I got two or 200 or 2,000 or 20. We've got a voice and we've got to have it go out. Yeah, go ahead and stand to your feet. We have no king but King Jesus. Amen. We love you, Lord, and we thank you, Father. Now, Rick, quickly, where you're standing. I know it's been a little hoiky-joiky, and I love the shoes. <laughs> Sherry, check them out. 
Wait a minute. I might could do that little. Mm. Oh, calf cramp. I was going to moonwalk, but I got too many wrinkles in my carpet. I love the Lord. Joy of the Lord is my strength. That's why I'm so strong, because I'm happy. Amen? I, do, I, I believe it. I, I live the most joyful life you can imagine, because I know who I am in Christ, because I know who Christ is in me. And I, I have a great time. And I know it's been maybe a little different for you, and, and I, do, I do want you to try to at least come back one more time, Trice, uh, if you're looking. But uh, a lot of fun today, but let's get down to what we're really here about. If you're here today and you've never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, that's the most important thing in the world. This government can be redeemed by the Lord. The Lord may say it's time for all this stuff to come in, in Matthew chapter 24 and let's get it on. I don't know which way it's going to go. I know what I've been called to do in it though and preach and prophesy to it though, okay? But regardless of that, the thing that matters the most is I am saved by the grace of God. I've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. I'm walking in His power and strength, amen? And if you've never surrendered your life to Christ, Today, without any strings attached, listen to me now, you, you're not going to join Journey Church today. We don't, we don't even allow that. We don't care about your church membership right now. We just want you to get Jesus. And, and you're not going to get religion because religion can take you to hell fast. We want you to get a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ by surrendering all your life to Him. And then we would love to come beside you fine. If you go, so, We don't care. Just come into the kingdom of God Amen. and begin to get armored up. So if you're here today, let's just bow our heads. And you've never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior with no strings attached. You want to say, today's my day. I know it's been hooky and some guy's up here in a dress, a robe. It ain't a dress, it's a robe. Hallelujah. Make that clear. But irregardless, Jesus Christ is Lord and I've never surrendered my life to Him. And there's heaven and hell waiting on me. Heaven is by Jesus Christ. Hell is by denying him and living for myself. My friends, you can't save yourself and you cannot forgive your own sins. Only Jesus has the ability to do that. And if you're ready to accept that marvelous, love, wonderful, spirit-filled grace of his, just lift your hand up and say, I want to come into the kingdom of God. I want to surrender my life to him. Anybody, real quick. All right. How many would say today, been different, <laughs> wasn't expecting this. But Lord, I know you've birthed me into this earth for such a time as this. And I may not have on a black robe, but I wear my pants to work like this. And I go into my school like this. And I go, go to work here and I do this. And I go into town and I'm going to be going to the lake today. And I'm not going to leave my Jesus behind anymore. And if that hot topic gets brought up, I'm going to tell them what the Bible says. I'm going to do it with love and compassion, but I'm going to do it because I'm not going to be afraid anymore. Because I do not have a spirit of fear but of power, love, and a sound mind in the name of Jesus. And you're going to give me the tact to do it. You're going to give me the grace to do it. You're going to give me the power to do it. I am your vessel, Lord. How can I be saved and not be your vessel? I'm your vessel today, Lord. And if that's you and you want to take another step of walk in your boldness and, and you're, you're, you're conquering your fear, just lift your hand and say, I'm with you. I'm with you, Jesus. I'm the, I'm, I want to be part of that forerunner anointing of John the Baptist to the second coming of Christ. I want to tell people, he is coming. He's real. And he is coming, friend. And I want you to go to heaven with me. Father, we thank you today for the hands that are lifted. I bless them all for your glory. Everybody say, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Can we give our Lord and Savior a mighty shout of praise in this house? Yeah. Woo. Yeah. Hoorah.